Ask any grunt throughout history and they'll tell you urban warfare is their worst nightmare. Any window, alleyway, or bombed out building could be hiding the next enemy ambush. It's the most dangerous environment for soldiers to fight in. In March 2008, the last major fight of the Iraq war took place in Sadr City. The fate of the war and stability of the country would be determined by this battle's outcome. Now to Iraq and American troops on a mission in one of the poorest and most dangerous anti-American areas in all of Baghdad. Now one of the most dangerous places in Iraq is Baghdad's Sadr City, where American and Iraqi forces have been battling Shiite militias block by block. It was unclear if the insurgents or coalition forces would be victorious. But it appeared the enemy had a clear advantage since they were dug in defending a well-fortified city. It had become their last stronghold, close to the capital of Baghdad. If the coalition was going to win this fight, they were going to need to come up with a new strategy unlike anything we'd seen before. And the result still affects the situation in Iraq to this day. Yet barely anyone knows the details of this story. Welcome to Sadr City, a densely populated urban jungle of winding streets and tiny alleyways, home to two million people. Its location is very strategically important because it's only 16 kilometers away from Baghdad. That's rocket firing distance. A year before the battle during the surge, we saw special forces teams conducting frequent raids there against enemy leadership. During one of these raids, they called in close air support, but it went horribly wrong, resulting in civilian deaths. After that tragedy, Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki banned U.S. forces from even entering Sadr City. Since then, there was little to no U.S. forces presence in that city. This led to a decay in the security situation as insurgents flocked to the safe haven. Sadr City had become a gap in security where insurgents could set the battle conditions for themselves. They were up against the insurgent Mahedin army. Intelligence estimates put them at up to 8,000 fighters. In March of 2008, the fighters increased their rocket and mortar attacks on the capital of Baghdad, striking the Ministry of Interior government building. The initial onslaught on March 23rd saw the insurgents launching a coordinated offensive throughout Sadr City and it was focused on attacking Iraqi government buildings. This was to highlight the coalition's inability to provide security in Iraq. The enemy quickly captured the checkpoints throughout the city and used them to launch rockets into the Green Zone. Without security in the Green Zone, it was going to delegitimize the Iraqi Prime Minister al-Malaki. He reversed his position and directed the 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, to destroy the enemy insurgents by any means necessary. The task of defeating the Mehedin army was handed to Colonel John Hort, a native of Fayetteville, North Carolina. The U.S. forces retaliated with striker-mounted disruption patrols to deny the enemy the ability to launch attacks. Oh, well, first of all, it's pretty significant because we haven't had coalition forces in this area for a number of years. And fairly recently, it's, it's been known to be an area where insurgent activity has been high. So it's significant because this is our, our first step forward in this area uh, as part of the Baghdad security plan. These missions often found themselves in firefights surrounded by 100 enemy fighters or more. One platoon led by Lieutenant Morse was ordered to reinforce Iraqi forces at a checkpoint that was under attack while helping to escort the wounded to a small outpost. They were hit by an IED and attacked with small arms fire. This was a classic tactic of the insurgency. It's called a complex ambush where they destroy one vehicle in a convoy so the rest of the platoon is stuck and bogged down in a kill zone. Then another platoon would have to come up and help recover that downed vehicle. The insurgents would then focus their fire on the new platoon, destroying one of their vehicles. This in turn meant that yet another third platoon would have to come out to help recover both of the rest of the company. We continued to move to try and secure the, uh, you know, the rocket launch sites and uh, it just continually, it, it did uh, surprise us. A deliberately prepared defense that's pr taken weeks, if not months, to prepare. And um, complex ambushes with RPGs, small arms, and, uh, and a lot of IEDs. When the enemy decides to turn an urban environment like this into a battle zone, um, they choose to put the population at risk. 
Within one week, the unit with the call sign 12SCR lost six of their strikers, all to IEDs and RPGs. This forced Commander Holt to switch to heavier, up-armored vehicles that could withstand these attacks. So they would always have at least one Bradley and one tank. The enemy's goal here was to protect their launch sites. They did everything they could to stop U.S. forces from finding and destroying their launches. They even had a system of signals with black flags that let the other fighters know when they had successfully diverted an American patrol and that it was safe for them to fire more rockets at the government buildings. The end of March saw heavy fighting, but U.S. forces still hadn't made their proper assault into the city yet. To begin to understand how complex this battle was and the kind of politics that were involved, on March 28th, 550 Iraqi police quit and joined the insurgents. They said, quote, these weapons are defending the country, not for fighting your brothers, said Sheikh Salman al Fraji. During this period between March 23rd and March 31st, right before the invasion of Sadr City, the U.S. forces destroyed over 180 militants, Nine U.S. soldiers were KIA. The shelling on the green zone left two U.S. diplomats and one Iraqi government agent KIA. The costs were high and the battle hadn't even begun yet. So what was the possible solution to stopping these rocket attacks and securing a hostile urban environment? Colonel Hort came up with a clever new strategy to create a three mile long wall of concrete T-walls each of these concrete slabs were three meters high. There was no guarantee this would work, but it was their best shot, and they would only get one chance to do it right. Have you seen anything like this? No, I have not personally seen anything like this. On a good day, the soldiers put up 100 slabs. When the fighting is heavy, only eight. The worst job exposed, climbing a ladder to unhook the slabs from a crane. It's a test of wills on both sides. The insurgents can literally go to lunch, come back, and we've only moved about 30 meters. Think of how terrifying it must have been to be the soldier tasked with exposing themselves to unhook that concrete wall. Right on the other side of the street was the entire Mehdi army. The type of weapon system the enemy had, they tried to use against us up at the wall. I mean, it was step by step by step and fighting literally every hour of the day. On April 6th, the invasion began. It was led by elements of the Iraqi army, it was key to this battle that the optics from the outside world looking in would see the Iraqis as the leaders of this fight. It needed to be known that the Iraqi army were in charge. Here in the area, here in Saudi City, we're waiting on IA. They're pushing forward ahead of us. Once uh, they clear up farther, we're just going to follow behind them. The IAs are actually doing pretty good. They're pushing. They're actually, uh, as far as I can see, they're just pushing down the road. These guys are they're pretty quick and sneaky. They'll just do random shots and take off. After the Iraqi army nearly retreated, they pushed forward and fighting had mostly stopped early on April 11th as U.S. and Iraqi forces managed to advance down the main road through Sadr City and they set up a forward defense line inside the district. They had their foothold there from which to start laying concrete. Basically what we're trying to do is we want to partner up uh, with the uh, Iraqis and then eventually Iraq is taking the lead. So Hort and his men had to do something to keep them out. They decided to build a wall, a barrier straight across Sadr City. It would also create a buffer zone wide enough to prevent the militia rockets from reaching the green zone. Walls were slowly but surely going up throughout the city. Insurgents would use the cover of sandstorms to plant IEDs or attack the coalitions during low visibility because their movement was being restricted by these walls. And it was codenamed Operation Gold Wall and involved day in and day out concrete laying. These missions were to construct one continuous long T wall that stretched through Sadr City. This simple yet eloquent solution would prevent fighters from sneaking around and planting IEDs with ease. Most Iraqi veterans are familiar with these walls surrounding outposts and bases, but the wall's purpose here was very different. Instead of keeping the enemy out, it was meant to keep them trapped within Sadr City. It wasn't all that different from a medieval siege tactic, except they would use modern concrete walls and they would be laid with gas-powered cranes. 
on April 29, 2008, Army Captain Logan Veith was in the middle of setting up concrete barriers that were a vital strategic piece to this battle. At 7.30 a.m., Captain Veith and his platoon had been working all day and night to get these barriers up. We had just put our 60th barrier and all of the sudden we heard a big explosion, said Captain Veith. They were caught in a storm of enemy small arms fire and improvised explosives hitting one of their strikers. Captain Veith and Sergeant First Class Locklear ran towards the striker that had been hit. They ran towards it on foot while RPG explosions and AK-47 rounds landed all around them. The striker gunner had been badly burned. Captain Veith put him on his back and carried him to safety to another armored vehicle where they held the insurgents back in order to prevent their armor from falling into enemy hands. It took six weeks to complete the wall with three U.S. battalions. During this time, they fired 812 rounds from the 120mm main tank gun and 12,000 25mm Bradley rounds against the enemy. Close quarters, urban room clearing with special forces raids were another piece to solving the puzzle of Sadr City. In the southern portions of Sadr City, units executed a daily rhythm that had become commonplace in counterinsurgency battles. During the day, key leaders would meet with local leaders called sheikhs at their home. They would find out what kind of problems they needed solved, such as water treatment or unemployment. Infantry platoon leaders and platoon sergeants would work to solve these issues in order to secure the locals' loyalty. Night was a completely different story. Soldiers would switch from peacekeeping to war face as they executed raids, kicking in doors where suspected insurgents were staying. Colonel Farris referred to this as the day job and night job. During a brief ceasefire, an insurgent spoke to a reporter, which gave us some insight into their perspective on what was happening. The insurgent said, quote, we don't know what to do. If we carry guns, the government will oppose us. But if we put them down, the Americans will come surround our homes and capture us, end quote. That sounds like a horrible position to be in where some of them felt like they were stuck between multiple factions and armies not knowing how to avoid the conflict. On April 27th, the insurgents took advantage of another sandstorm that grounded the close air support assets, which were key for US forces. It was their main advantage. So a platoon sized element of fighters attacked a US checkpoint, but the M1A2 Abrams there made short work of all 22 of them and no US forces were even injured in the attack. Between April 30th and May 1st, the U.S. Army eliminated 28 militia in a series of separate attacks against them. On May 7th, a ceasefire went into effect, and a 14-point agreement was signed, which guaranteed the end to the rocket attacks on government buildings and the Green Zone entirely. All told, about 941 militia were KIA, 22 U.S. were KIA, nearly 600 civilians paid the ultimate price between rockets that were launched by the militia and fighting in the streets between the two groups. One of the reasons violence in Iraq has subsided so dramatically was a significant battle that U.S. forces won in Sadr City just five months ago. The fight was seen as a victory for the U.S. forces as they achieved their key mission goals. One of the major takeaways was that this was seen as an Iraqi army-led mission. Whether or not that was truly the case doesn't really matter. The optics on the world stage showed that this was a win by and for the Iraqis. I believe that time since then has shown that the Iraqi army is capable of defending their objectives to this day. I'm your host, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching. Task and Purpose out.